Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. And Asher, thank you for such a fantastic lead. And um, you, I, I, for, uh, I assume by now we have quite a few returnees uh, to this program. And I'm sure all of, all of you have had the same experience. Coming into that music is just astonishing. Um, it, it's always wonderful to have, uh, you know, such, a, such an incredible player as part of this. Um, so uh, please forgive, we had a, a bit of an echo at the beginning. There was a, a slight technical difficulty. I figured out what was going on and we will not let that happen again. Um, wanted to let you all know. <laughs> let Just you a little all know echoplex now. ood to start. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say, we, we, we went ahead, we had the, the looper pedal going. We, you know, that's, that's what you do in the, in the final program. You have to push the edge just a little bit. Um, <laughs> Well, uh, as I said, my name is Lori Black. I'm the Associate Director of the Lowell Milken Center for Music of American Jewish Experience at the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. And we are very pleased to co-present uh, this program uh, with the HUC JIR Jewish Language Project and uh, our dear colleague, uh, Sarah Benor. Um, this is the final in a series of three programs that we have done uh, featuring the wonderful uh, Udist and scholar uh, Asher Shasha Levy. Um, one of the fun things about working in a field like Jewish music is that you are almost always working with your friends. Uh, and uh, the, the, you know, the, the uh, sound check for this um, particular program was so much fun because it was a chance to not only, uh, you know, get to, to hear incredible music and, and, you know, hear about the music, but also, uh, reconnect with uh, uh, a wonderful friend and wonderful musician and that individual is our guest tonight Asher Shasha Levy, Udist vocalist um, and uh, Syrian Jewish musician and scholar of Sephardic heritage and culture. Uh, Asher seeks to spread the beauty of Sephardic tradition through his writing, recording, research and concerts. He performs and teaches internationally and is the founder and leader of the Aram Soba Ensemble, a group dedicated to the musical heritage of Syrian Jewry. Studying with elders and scholars in the Sephardic community of Los Angeles, Asher has amassed a large repertoire of liturgical music, a secular song in Hebrew and Judeo-Arabic, as well as piyutim, pismonim, and bakashot, the religious poetry and song of the Jewish Middle East. Uh, very excited to present Asher Shasho Levy in this program, Jewish Prayer in Many Languages from Sephardic Seattle to Syrian Brooklyn. Thank you, Asher. Thank you so much, Lori. Um, 
this is just such a joy as always to be able to share with everyone these riches, these true treasures of the Sephardic tradition. Um, today's program, I think, is particularly rich. I'm going to focus on one particular type of liturgy from one particular community, though we'll hear examples from other communities as well. But within that one, one vein, there is probably more material than any single topic that I've covered, and that would include the, the multi-community focused sessions as well. Uh, and what I'm referring to is Ladino Selichot Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur liturgy. So there is a unique, there's this unique um, tradition that you have in the Ottoman Jewish communities of basically translating prayers, translating liturgy into Judeo-Spanish and doing so in a way that preserves the word order of the Hebrew and, and is sort of very textually based, a sort of almost, you could say, stilted translation, um, archaic in some ways. Um, and that is Ladino. So Ladino, most people speak of Judeo-Spanish or Judesmo um, and call it Ladino, the spoken form. And that's um, a sort of a casual usage that's accepted today. But really, Ladino refers to the liturgical Judeo-Spanish that developed this en la dinar of the Torah, this like a targum basically, um, but one that is less interpretive and more of a sort of literal word for word translation. So that's what we have with this Ladino liturgy initially. So you have in 1865, the al Sheikh version of the tefillah for Yamim Noraim, for Rosh Hashanah, for Yom Kippur, um, and for the Silly Hot published in Vienna. And um, this was, at, even at the time in the 19th century, this was a sort of archaic, purposely archaic language that was being employed in this text. Uh, and it was meant to sort of convey the, uh, the awesome ancient quality that the Hebrew has, but in doing so, it was maybe a bit stilted and less accessible. And so by the early 20th century, you have a demand in Sephardic communities that are rapidly modernizing in the Ottoman Empire for a text that is more accessible. And so the, that need was filled by um, Rabbi Reuben Eliyahu Yisrael, who was a haham of the Sephardic community in Romania, actually. It was a Europeanized Sephardic community, you could say, in Romania. And so as a result, he published his text initially in Latin characters, which would have been fairly uncommon for Ladino texts, which would have typically been in Hebrew characters. Um, but Rabbi Israel was from Rhodes. He was from the, the island community of Rhodes, and that community was more traditional and um, still used the Hebrew characters for the Ladino. So in 1910, there were two editions that were published. There was one um, that was published for his Romanian congregation, and there was one that was published for the Rhodes community and was also used in other communities in Turkey. It ended up being reprinted many times. So the Izmir community, Istanbul communities used it. Um, Livorno in Italy, um, it was eventually printed in Brussels, in Buenos Aires, and most importantly for our purposes in Seattle, Washington. So the Sephardic community of Seattle, Washington is very well established by the early 20th century. You had a community there and the community hails from primarily two places, um, what they would call the Turkish community, which would be um, Izmir, Istanbul, places like that, and the Rhodes community, which is from the island of Rhodes, which at the time was Turkish, it was Ottoman, but you know, today is part of Greece. So in Seattle, these Ladino texts were maintained and the tradition of singing them was maintained and um, they were republished there several times, including most recently as part of the new set of, of Mahzorim by Hazan uh, Yitzhak Ezos. And we're going to hear several, in, um, several recordings, actually, of the Hazan chanting some of, these, some of these texts. So as I mentioned, this version of the 
of the Silichot, of the Tefillah, was more, it was meant to be more modern. It was meant to be a freer translation, not quite the word for word, word calc of the Al Sheikh 1865 version, but it's interesting. At that time in these Ottoman communities, Ladinos hold and, and Judeo Spanish's hold on the community was sort of slipping away due to various modernizing factors. Um, people were really speaking more Turkish, they were speaking more French, Italian, um, these other languages due to trade needs as well as just various political factors, um, you know, the Alliance schools teaching French to, you know, lots of different factors. So the Ladino of the time incorporated far more loan words from different languages than the Ladino of the 1865 edition. And it really shows you that this language that a lot of people think of erroneously as being some sort of frozen medieval Spanish that they brought with them from Spain to the Ottoman Empire, you see that it's really, it's a, it's a living, evolving language, at least until fairly recently. And one thing that's, that's really beautiful about these, about these texts is they were really meant to facilitate involvement from every member of the community. That's the reason these texts developed, was so that everyone would understand the words of the prayers. But more than that, they were written in order to fit the melodies of the Hebrew prayers that they are translations of. So it allowed people to actually sing along with the melodies that they knew. So it facilitated multiple levels of involvement that otherwise would not have been available to people who were, you know, many of them were not as fluent in Hebrew or didn't, in the case of the women mostly, didn't really know it at all. So today's program is going to be far more music focused than previous programs. Uh, in the past, there's been a lot to go over and a lot of history. And while there is so much that we could talk about, I think the richness of this repertoire uh, in many ways speaks for itself. And so while I'll be playing many of these pieces for you today, I think it's only appropriate to begin with the steward of the tradition, Hazan Ezos, um, singing the Ahot Ketana for Ereb Rosh Hashanah. First night of Rosh Hashanah, the first paragraph in Hebrew and Ladino. Ahot Ketana La nación judía recita oraciones, ella entona sus alabaciones, oh Dios me les Todas sus pasiones termine la añada y sus maldiciones. So you see that, and first of all, what an incredible, incredible performance, incredibly evocative of the tradition and of the holidays and, and Hazan Ezos just brings so much to all of his tefillot and we are lucky to to have him continuing these traditions in such a vibrant way um, but as you as you heard the Ladino fits the same melody as the Hebrew and in many cases the tefillah would be conducted one stanza Hebrew next stanza Ladino and so on and so forth um, and in fact the next piece 
that I'm going to play does the same thing. And this is from the Selichot. So this is in the Sephardic communities for the whole month of Elul, every day the Selichot is recited. So this is the Imafes for the Selichot. And it's interesting, Imafes is actually, um, it's an Ashkenazi piyut. Um, I, I forget who is the author. Um, I think Ephraim of Regensburg, but I could be, I could be wrong on that. Um, it's, it's, I believe, 12th century Ashkenazi composition, 13th century. Again, not looking at it, so I, do, I don't know the precise details there, but uh, definitely something that is not original to the, to the Sephardic communities, but all of the Sephardic communities of the Ottoman Empire and in North Africa, and, and indeed today in the sort of standardized um, Jerusalem, Sephardic Edot Hamizrach Iraqi influenced Nosach that's most common among Sephardim worldwide. You see this. You see this piece. So this is Imafes, um, and the melodies you'll note. Many of them are, if not exactly the same as the famous Jerusalem Sephardic melodies, um, or even the Syrian melodies. They they are related. There is sort of a family of Ottoman melodies. And so that would continue on and on, and they would go through um, several more stanzas. Let's see. Um, another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. You have uh, like twenty stanzas of this that would go back and forth in in the silihot. And in some cases, you would have stanzas that are um, what you might do, and certain communities would do this: is you would take the piyut. And you would do the entirety of the piyut, but you would do it half and half. You wouldn't necessarily translate each stanza. It would be one in Hebrew, the next stanza in translation, so on and so forth. Okay, so there, there's so much, so much beautiful liturgy here. And I'd like to continue with another piece that would be part of the Selichot for the month of Elul. So currently in Sephardic communities every day, um, this, is, this is being said. And in fact, if you went up to Seattle, you would be able to um, take part in a tefillah that, that has these pieces actually as part of their living tradition. Even here in LA at, at uh, Tiferet Israel, uh, parts of the tefillah on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur are done this way. But in Seattle, uh, it's done far more. There's a higher percentage of the service is done in, in Ladino. And in fact, 
I believe the Rhodes tradition of which uh, one of the two Sephardic synagogues in Seattle follows has the highest percentage of Ladino in their liturgy compared to, you know, say, Salonika or Izmir or some of the other Alexandria in Egypt, the other Ladino speaking communities. So we're going to do now Bezohri al Mishkabi, another piece from the city Hot, and it's going to be the same way. I'm going to do one stanza in Hebrew and then the next stanza in Ladino. <laughs> So musically, many of these pieces are in uh, a maqam, a mode that you would have in, in Ottoman and Arabic music um, that's called bayat or its variant ushak or husseini. These are all variants of the same basic scale. So what you have is it's a type of minor basically where the second degree is is what they call a neutral second where it's neither uh, natural or flat it's in between so a, a microtone or a quarter tone though that's not exactly accurate because depending on geography some places play it sharper or flatter um, it's th that scale either or so a lot of the pieces for the Yamim Noraim in various Ottoman Sephardic, Levantine Sephardic communities have this quality of being in this maqam. In particular, maqam Husseini, which is, you could say, a higher variant on maqam bayat. So it focuses on the second half of the scale. So. Husseini is associated with, with glory, and it's considered to be sort of a regal and, um, and glorious maqam, so it's associated with the high holidays um, in, these, in these various communities. Okay, so let's return to um, our beautiful historical recordings so you can get a sense of the richness of the different hazanim in the different communities. So uh, we're going we're gonna to listen to Avinu Malkenu, which is done in Ladino, much as these other uh, tefilot have been done. And this version is uh, from Turkey, from, from Ankara in Turkey, um, Hazan Yehuda Alamaz. So this would be the tradition that is preserved at the at, at one of the two Seattle synagogues. So there's a, a there's Bikur Holim in Seattle, which is which is the Turkish, and then there's Ezra Besarot, which is the Rodisli. And so at the at the Turkish, you would be hearing a variant on this melody. <laughs> Oh, 
caracteres y con voluntad a nuestra adoración. Nuestro Padre y nuestro Rey, no nos tornes al vacío de delante de ti. So this version is in Maqam Hijaz, which you'll hear in a lot of Sephardic communities, Avinu Malkenu, and other parts of the Tefilot for Yamim Noraim, will be in Maqam Hijaz, which is related to what the Ashkenazim referred to as Fregish, uh, with some differences. Uh, so Hijaz, as, as we just heard. <laughs> That's the feeling of Hijaz, uh, and you'll hear a lot of songs, even like Piyutim, like the famous Syrian uh, Jerusalem Sephardic Piyut, Ozreini El Hai is, is in this maqam, and many of the tefilot for the season are in this maqam. So moving along, uh, I'm going to sing a little bit of the Yedera Shim, which is one of the Piyutim that is sung on the morning of Rosh Hashanah as part of the Shahrit. There are many Piyutim that are sung in both Hebrew and Ladino. This one is one of the more well-known, and uh, it has a beautiful melody. There are two different melodies that I'm going to sing. So I'm going to sing the first verse in, in the melody that would be used for the introductory stanzas, and then I'm going to move to the very last verse and introduce that melody. Until you get to the last stanzas where the melody changes. So 
So that melody is maybe familiar to some from use in the Selichot in the Jerusalem Sephardic community. And, and as a result of that, it spread to most other Sephardic communities. So in Los Angeles, I've heard in Moroccan communities, uh, Iraqi communities, singing that same melody that um, originally would have been in, in mostly Ottoman communities. So the Ladino speaking communities, as well as sort of the, the general Syrian Egyptian milieu. Um, but that, yeah, done for usually a chot for Ben Adam Malecha Nirdam. Ben Adam Malecha Nirdam Kum Kera Beta Hanunim, which is the beginning of the Selichot, really the second piece after Kamti, but that's the Kamti is really the introduction. It's really the beginning of Selichot. And so for many people in Sephardic traditions, it's one of the melodies that's most, I would say, evocative of the season. And again, it's, it's definitely worth noting that these texts are, are written with, with these melodies in mind. Um, we're going to continue onward um, with another really beautiful piece, maybe one of the emotional, if not the emotional highlight, I would say, of the Rosh Hashanah service in the Sephardic liturgy is Et Sha'are Ratzon, which is a poetic telling of the story of the Akedah, of the, of the binding of Isaac. And it's a extremely dramatic and, and moving piece of, of poetry that basically gives Isaac a voice in the narrative and allows him to speak back to uh, and, and comment on the events. And it's really, it's really an incredible piece that I think is one of the most, yeah, just really, really one of the most incredible representatives of, of the, this tradition of incredibly poetic and creative Hi. texts. Um, so we're going to hear Violetta Fintz um, from Rhodes singing it Shaare Ratzon. Es hora que las puertas de tu perdón sean abiertas dio a tu comunidad. Acordate del paso de la antigüedad, o oh, que de vean y cal me amis vean. La prueba diezena que el Dios potente provo Abraham es la siguiente. Toma Israel tu descendiente y hazlo alzación a mi presente. Aunque lo amas, amor ardiente, oh, que de anicad, de amis Really, really a beautiful, I mean, the text is, is, is so, so rich and poetic and, and really emotional. And this melody, I think, really captures that feeling, though there are many incredibly gorgeous melodies that I would recommend people investigating from, from different Sephardic communities. The, the Aleppo melody is, is gorgeous. Libyan melody is gorgeous. The Moroccan melody is gorgeous. Um, but this one is, is special. Um, this is in fact the one that, that is done at uh, Sephardic Temple Tiferet Israel here in Los Angeles. And it, as a result, the melody that I, that I grew up with. So I'm Syrian, but growing up in, in a community that followed the Turkish and Rhodes customs, um, I grew up with a lot of these pieces. And I have a real love and fondness for this tradition. And I was able to visit a few years ago Rhodes and, and go to the synagogue there and, and be able to see it. It was really spend a Shabbat. And, and while the community there is, is very small today, after the decimation of the Shoah and that even following years of, of people leaving, there still is a community there that is that is well served by um, Rabbi Negrin, the chief rabbi of Greece um, in Athens, who is very, very, very careful to preserve these unique traditions there. So um, if you're ever, if you ever happen to be in, in Greece and in, in Rhodes, do seek out the, the Kahal Shalom there in the synagogue. Um, Okay, so let's continue. There's so there's so much to look at here. Uh, so many so many different 
different pismonim, so many different incredible melodies and texts. But uh, the next piece that we're going to look at is Adonai Shamati Venir Gazti, a incredible piyut that is sung on the afternoon of Rosh Hashanah. And um, first, before I sing the version from Rhodes in Ladino, I'd like to hear um, a little bit of Asher Mizrahi singing it. So Asher Mizrahi is one of the most, I think, important and remarkable personalities in 20th century Sephardic life. He was uh, of Judeo-Spanish descent uh, from, from Jerusalem, born in Jerusalem, and learned Arabic music, learned the Judeo-Spanish Hazanut, really assimilated all of these different elements to uh, take the music to, to such great heights that he actually, at a certain point, he served as the Hazan in, Mal in the community of Malta. And when that became too provincial, basically, for his talents, he moved to Tunisia and lived there for many, many years, where not only was he the Hazan, but he was also a secular star. Um, and had a whole career recording, um, performing in totally secular venues, but was also the Hazan of the community. And towards the end of his life, he came back to Israel. Many of his songs are extremely famous today in Sephardic communities around the world. Some of them, including Nagila, Hallelujah, Nagila, Baziman, that's one of his songs, or Habibi. Two of his most famous compositions. So it's a real treat to get to hear him sing the traditional Sephardic melody for this piyut, because oftentimes when we have older recordings, it's not always the greatest hazan of the generation at the height of their powers. Oftentimes it's, it's community members or various people who can who know the piece and are, and are recording it, but to have really a beautiful, th this really will show you some of the, the heights of the improvisatory tradition that you have in the Makam-based Sephardic Hazanut. incredible performance, incredible depth of, of soul in that, and what an incredible opportunity we have to hear. It's, it's, it's such an auditory window into this world that while it's still, it's still surviving, it, it's not, not the same, obviously, as it was. Um, so let's continue. There's so much, actually, that I could, that I could sing and then I could play that I'm going to move through things a, a little bit faster. Um, so that piece would be also sung in, in the Ladino, Adonai Shamati Shimacha, but, um, and it would be to the same melody. I'm not going to sing that now. I'd like to move on to another couple pieces. I'm going to do a little bit of Lema Ancha Elohai. That's from the uh, Rosh Hashanah Tefillah. <laughs> Yo, 
Recibe con benevolencia al pueblo que busca en esta mañana tu clemencia. Adonai Akshiva, base al Tehar, por amor. Dios mío, releva de las profunduras a los hartos de fiel, a defla y amarduras, cativos y esmovidos de miseria y estrechuras. Oye su enclamación, no mire sus manguras, Adonai Akshiva, va a ser al Tehar. So, in Yom Kippur, you have a few pismonim that are very well known that are sung in this way in the, in the Ladino translation. You also have huge segments of the service. So, for instance, in all of the silichot where you have a vidui, so like the vidui of shahrit, of musaf, of, of minha, all every one of those those viduim is translated in a sort of the free translation of Reuven Eliyahu Israel into Ladino. Since these are not necessarily very musically interesting. Uh, if anyone is interested in these sections, they will be posted to the Jewish languages website with recordings. But let's move to one of the more, the more beautiful, in my opinion, of the pismonim that you have in the tefillah of Yom Kippur from the Minha of Yom Kippur, Ya Shema Evyonecha. Beautiful, beautiful melody in Makam Nawa. So related to the Makam that we had of Bayat, but Nawa, the concept is that it always resolves on G. So, and that's, it ends the phrase there. Whereas in Bayat, you would have, but Nawa hangs off the G. This is probably the most famous melody in this maqam. Of, of this of this maqam. So 
we're going to finish our exploration of this liturgy. There is so much more, um, even of the pieces that I think of as being extremely musically compelling moments of the tefillah that people in Sephardic congregations would all know these melodies and be able to sing along. I probably left out half of, of from that category, not even including the things that are more uh, just chanted text. So, you know, in the Mincha of Yom Kippur, the Haftarah, the reading of the book of Jonah is done entirely in Ladino, in this tradition. So, you know, you have all of these different other elements of richness in the liturgy, and all of it will be on the Jewish languages website. So if you are interested in that, do check it out. We're going to, we're going to finish with uh, El Nora Alila as we finish the Yom Kippur with the Neila, El Nora Alila. So I'd like to start by listening to just a little bit of a recording from L.A., actually, of, of two Rodoslis, uh, Hiskia Franco and Vida Turiel, recorded here in 1966 as part of the Rodosli community. So this is a beautiful, a beautiful peek into the L.A. Sephardic past. Um, Asher, uh, yes. just to clarify, is it the one labeled... Uh... Uh, chanting, not the chanting of Kol Nidre. It, it says, I think, Neila. Is oh, how it's forgive labeled. me. Gotcha. Ahora cantamos la hora de la Neila. Elinora Lila. Elinora Lila. Asila no me gila, bechata me gila, odio grande y poderoso, enchalchado y temiroso, acordanos tu perdón, en hora de neila, en hora alila, en hora alila, asila no me gila, El pueblo de esta sinagoga, sus ojos a ti de cola, se estremece con dolor. En hora de neila, en hora alila, en hora alila, ansila no me gila, bechata neila. What a beautiful melody, beautiful recording, a, a peek into our history here in Los Angeles. I'm going to sing two more stanzas of El Nora Alila in order to sing two other melodies um, that you would hear in other Ottoman Jewish communities. I'll do the same two first stanzas, actually. Uh, the first one is a Turkish melody that's uh, popular in Jerusalem, related to the melody that we just heard. No. 
So today I only touched on the richness of liturgy that you have for the Yamim Noraim from the Ottoman Judeo-Spanish speaking communities. And that doesn't even begin to touch all of the different variants of melodies that you have for the Pismonim in, in Hebrew. So there's just an incredible richness. And again, as I mentioned, if you're interested in hearing more of this, there will be many more historical recordings, scans of much of the Rabbi Reuven Eliyahu Yisrael Ladino Selichot. A complete version of the Al Sheikh Selichot will all be up on the uh, Jewish Language Project site. Okay, thank you so much, Asher. Wow, we've gotten uh, so much interesting and uh, musical information today. And it was really just a pleasure to listen to you and also to the recordings of everyone that you shared with us. So thank you very much. You. Um, as people are coming up with their questions to put in the chat, I just want to point out that there's this interesting tension between making the prayers accessible in a language that people understand and maintaining this ancestral language, Ladino, that uh, is no longer the primary language of communication in most of the communities where this is, where these prayers are, are used, but is still very important. And it really has become a sacred language, right? You know, you think of Absolutely. Hebrew and Aramaic as Lashon HaKodesh, but this, but Ladino in, in Sephardic communities is also sacred in its own way. Um, and also when you, when you talked before about the archaic nature of the Ladino translations, um, that has a parallel in many Jewish languages around the world where there will be some archaic features in their textual translation, but also in their spoken language as well. And uh, the, one of the reasons that it sounds archaic is, is because it is sometimes a direct translation of the Hebrew, right? So would you say that a lot of the prayers that you sang today or that we heard recordings of are direct translations of the Hebrew into Ladino? Yes, they all are. But the I think all of the pieces that I sang were the Ladino of Reuven Eliyahu Yisrael. The Avinu Malkenu that we heard was the Al Sheikh. So that one would be a true calc. It would be really stilted almost. And the need for Rabbi Yisrael to provide a new Ladino translation was to sort of bring it into, I don't want to say a modern idiom, because really by 1910, already people were starting to speak French and Italian and Turkish and other languages. So it wasn't necessarily, it was, it was probably the last moment in time where you could really speak of Ladino and Judeo-Spanish as being the, the true living languages of these communities. But to the point that you, that you bring up, what that does is it, it provides another aspect of this as sort of a sacred piece of history that these people are continuing. And when you have the multiple levels of diaspora going on, these different layers from 1492 from Spain and then into the Ottoman Empire, and then after especially the Balkan Wars where you have all of this disruption, then it becomes something that is being brought then from that place to the new communities. And so it really is important in maintaining that heritage. And yeah, today I would say that Ladino Ladino in particular is, is definitely a sacred language for Sephardic Jews. It, it's, you know, Judeo-Arabic for Arabic speaking Jews would not have been a sacred language in the same way. It would have been a language of study, certainly of studying texts and things like that, but it wasn't used in the ritualized context of tefillah in the synagogue. It never replaced Hebrew. If anything, it would just be added, but it never replaced Hebrew, whereas in the Ladino-speaking communities, it did. And there definitely is that tension between the need to make it accessible, but also to, you know, have, have this tangible link to the Sephardic past. Mm, that's so interesting. And I think you see the same with Yiddish a little bit, that there is some Yiddish sacred uh, uh, discourse like in uh, Tichinus, uh, you know, the prayers that, that women did and the Tzenarena, but, but it's a little different because it's not used in the synagogue setting in the same way as it is in Ladino. And, and um, it seems like 
that is pretty unusual for, for Ladino in the contemporary world. There are also translations of prayers into many Jewish languages, especially Judeo-Italian. There's a very large tradition of Calc translation of, of the prayer book and uh, Judeo-Provençal spoken in the southern part of France. Uh, that has uh, also a long tradition. And, and so, um, but it's interesting that Ladino seems to have taken over in that practice in, in the modern period in ways that other languages didn't. But, you know, we do have remnants of this in Jewish English in, in the archaic and calc word for word translation. Right. And uh, one of like, for example, you, you say, blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe. Right. So the use of thou, I mean, that that actually is probably influenced by Protestant translations of the Torah of the Bible into English um, using that archaic language, but also the thou, like the I thou relationship right, kind right. of thing. But but even just saying blessed are you, O Lord or God, instead of saying you are blessed, God, right? right. That is it's because it's Baruch Ata, right? So it's it's right. the direct translation. Um, so and yes, calc. Uh, someone asked in in the chat what the word calc is, and I'll put that in the in the chat it is a it means direct word for word translation from one language to another where you're not translating it in a vernacular way uh, in an idiomatic way you're translating it to preserve some of that word order and that is true in in every jewish language that i know of that translates the torah there is some degree of that to try to maintain a little bit of the flavor of the original hebrew so there is a question in the chat about um, the Ya'ale prayer, and is that used traditionally in Ladino? I don't think the Ya'ale prayer is part of the Sephardic liturgy. Okay. Um, the, I've only known it, I, I mean, I could be wrong, uh, but I've only known it to be from my time with Ashkenazim. I don't, I don't believe it's part of the Sephardic liturgy. Okay. So it, that's actually, it's worth noting that the Sephardic liturgy for the Yamim Noraim is vastly different from the Ashkenazi liturgy. Um, if you have spent time in Sephardic communities on a Shabbat morning, you'd note that the liturgy is not vastly different. Uh, it's more of a matter of a word here or there and the order of the Psalms that are said in the introductory section. And, and there are other differences, obviously. That's, that's vastly simplifying it. But Yamim Noraim, oftentimes, you know, Sephardim who are part of Ashkenazi communities will go specifically to a Sephardic community to spend the Yamim Noraim because it's not only a matter of melodies. Most of the Pismonim, uh, the Piyotim, rather, that I sang today and that we went through are not present at all in the Ashkenazi liturgy. Um, you know, El Nora Alila is not part of the Ashkenazi liturgy outside of its introduction by Sephardim in various congregations. Um, but you know, Yashema Ebionecha, Yisrael Avadecha, Lemaancha Elohai, Adonai Shamati, Et Sha'arei Ratzon, Yedei Rashim, Bezochri. Um, none of these are part of the Ashkenazi liturgy in, in any form. Avinu Malkeinu, of course, but um, the Ashkenazi liturgy has its own beauty, basically. Yeah, and so would you say that a Sephardic service would be longer than an Ashkenazi service because of all these additional PU team or just about the same because they each have their own separate ones. Yeah, it's about the same. And, and I would say one thing that's different about the flow of a Sephardic service is there is a effort to not ever interrupt a section of the service with PU team. So Shahrit is done on its own. So you have Shahrit and you have PU team that come before and after it. So basically in the breaks in the service, which is signified with a Kaddish. So when you have a Hatsi Kaddish or a Kaddish Tit Kabal or one of these, you know, various, you know, Kaddishim that break up the service, then you would have uh, the Pew team. So, you know, before Nishmat is one place that Pew team are said. After Kaddish Tit Kabal, before the Torah is taken out, Pew team are said there. Before the Shofar service, before Musaf. So it's a different structure. You know, the Amidah doesn't really have a lot of Pew team in it. But, you know, before and after. I, th I think the length is about the same. I, I just, the, the major difference is that in a Sephardic service, everything is said out loud. There's nothing that is said quietly. 
if you're going to say it, it is sung out loud. Some stuff is just chanted, not in, in a, not in a melody per se, but just in one of the makamat, sort of in, in sort of a rhythmical reading, like, like a Torah reading. And then there are melodies for other things, call and response, oftentimes in actually in, I would say pretty much all of the Sephardic communities, the service is led by the Hazan with two other people, the Somchim. So on either side of the Hazan would be a Somech and they would lead the congregational parts. So when there's this antiphonal sort of prayer where the Hazan um, chants a line and the congregation has to respond, the, the Somchim serve as the like Shilichim, like the, the emissaries of the congregation on the Teva um, and help lead the congregation. Okay. Uh, well, it looks like we're just about out of time. I know there were a few more questions, but um, if you have those, feel free to stick around and, and we can discuss those after we end the official program. Um, but also someone asked for the link in the chat to the uh, website where this material will be posted in the next few days, and that is jewishlanguages.org slash liturgy. And there's already a lot of material there from the previous three sessions in this wonderful series. And um, it, it looks like um, one final thing that might be a good uh, research project for someone uh, is, is how these Sephardi and Mizrahi tunes and melodies and, and, and elements of liturgy end up in Ashkenazi congregations and, the, and how they change along the way in their musical uh, presentation and in their linguistic presentation and um, and whether people even know their origins. I mean, we're in a time period of mixing right now, as the, as the Jewish world has always been to some extent. But now we're in this in this period of hyper mixing in Israel and the United States and other places in other Jewish communities. And um, and this is, I think is a great example of that, where we have the UCLA Milken Center pre pre presenting music, Jewish music in America in so many different forms. Uh, you, you might have a klezmer session and then a, uh, you know, Ladino translations of tefillah session right after each other. So I want to thank the UCLA Milken Center and all of our co-sponsors and Asher in particular for this wonderful series. Um, the Jewish Language Project has uh, a, a, some events coming up. And if you're not yet on our mailing list, you can find a link on our website to sign up for that. One of them is going to be about Sephardic Jewish Papiamentu, which was spoken in Curacao. And there are still remnants of it today in the Caribbean. So um, I hope that you'll join us for that and for future events. Thank you.